Welcome to session six, where we will be talking about today the restored opportunity for communion. If you recall the way that we've talked about this as we've come along, we've looked at really the understanding of who we are and who God is in the sense of communion, a communion of persons, a communion of love. And we've kind of, as we've stepped through our sessions, we've talked about the history of what has happened to this communion, that we were originally created in a communion. This communion through human sin, human rebellion, was lost. And that we are now east of Eden. We're not where we're supposed to be. We found that it is very difficult now to live in accordance with the way that we're called to live. We find that which is most important to us, our relationships, the most difficult aspects of our lives because we fail at them so much, so easily. And the reason that we have such difficulty with our relations is because we don't have the capacity, we don't have self-mastery. And even with self-mastery, the, the amount of self-mastery that we can gain through our efforts alone isn't sufficient, that we need more. We need God's help. We need God's very life within us. We talked about really this understanding this last session, and the last session can't be understated, the importance of it. This is really what love looks like. We talked about, especially in the last session, or the last part of that last session, really what love looks like, this eternal gift that the Son gives back to the Father is manifested in time, it's made present, it's shown to us in time in the cross. And we saw what Jesus did for us. What he does eternally with the Father, he's done for us in the most unimaginable of ways. He's given us himself to us and for us to reestablish this communion. So if we go back and pick up that little model that we've been using, this model of God as a communion of persons, a radical unity of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who again created freely, not necessarily, but freely, meaning that we are gifts for ourselves. We were created in this communion with God, but because of rebellion, it was lost. And there's no repairing, if you will, this first creation. And so what did we say that God did? A new creation with the incarnation, where humanity and divinity are now reunited. And we have said that all of this is one act, but the intensity of it, the desire that God has for communion with us, this restored communion with us, can only be understood from the perspective of the cross. The cross is what love lo looks like east of Eden. Right? The cross is what love looks like east of Eden. This is the cross. The cross is this pouring out of ourselves totally for others to the point of death if necessary. And because of the fall, because of Satan, Satan does his best to make sure that the cross is necessary. This is why Jesus told us that if we are to be his disciples, if we want to follow after him, we have to be ready to pick up our cross. And so the son returns back to the father. Like he does eternally, he returns himself to the father. In time, he returns back to the father, and the Holy Spirit then comes. The Holy Spirit comes to us at Pentecost. Just like he has breathed forth eternally in God, in time, he comes forth to us at this birthday of the church. And this is what we're gonna talk about today, the church, this restored opportunity for communion. Because we had said that with Adam and Eve, everybody now knows exactly what Adam and Eve look like, right? After six sessions, you've got it burned into your mind, right? With Adam and Eve, we were born, all born as children of Adam and Eve but we aren't going any place. We're not meant to be here on earth in this current broken state. This is no longer our home. 
this first creation was ruptured. We have to get off of this relational dead end and get into this new creation. And how do we do that? We'll talk about next time the, sacrament, the liturgy and the sacramental system. But ultimately, at this point in time, we can say to do that, we have to get there through the cross. Only through the cross can we die to this first creation so that we can rise again with Jesus Christ into this new creation. And we do that first through baptism, right? The signs of baptism is not simply the washing away of sin, which it is, but it is actually in the, this is one of the reasons why full immersion is a more perfect sign of baptism, because we symbolize going down into the waters of death and rising again up out of them. And when we are in Christ, when we're unified with Christ, we are in the church. To be with Christ means to be in the church. As St. Cyprian, a bishop in the early church, put it, he said, he cannot have God as father who will not have church as mother. Right? If you are un in union with Christ, whether you know it or not, you're in his one holy Catholic and apostolic church. The church, therefore, is this communion. It's not simply a human institution. There is a human aspect of it, but it is also divine. And when we're united with Jesus Christ, we're united with him in such a radical way that we become like him. If we transform ourselves, we have to cooperate. And we'll talk more about this in our last two sessions. So here is the only way back to where we belong communion with God, by being in Christ, right? So there are two options. There is no third option. We can be here in this broken creation. We can be like Adam and Eve were when they first rebelled. They, we can be like the demons. We can be our own autonomous gods, if you will, without God. But this is the key. There is only communion in God. There's only authentic relationship in God. And so one of the worst things that we can imagine is being alone, right? In many ways, we would much rather suffer the worst sufferings together than we would want to be alone and healthy because we know by ourselves aloneness we suffer. Our aloneness is a misery. And this is a kind of a tip. We're, we'll have throw these in every now and then. But one of the things that Satan wants to do, because Satan is radically alone by himself, and this is the way he will spend eternity. Everybody in hell is radically alone, and this is the way that they will spend eternity. Satan knows that we are made for communion because he was made for communion. And so his key, his approach is to isolate us and to try to get us to think that we're alone. And guess what? When we find ourselves down, depressed, when we have the sense of being alone, do we go out and be around, try to be around others? Ironically, no, we're tempted to go off by ourselves and be alone, which is exactly Satan's temptation to us, right? In a certain sense, the demons are like a pack of dogs, a pack of wild dogs hunting, right? And how do a pack of wild dogs hunting a herd, a, commun you know, a communion, a herd work? They try to isolate one member so that he's off on his own, and then he's vulnerable. This experience, all of us have experienced these types of experiences, right? Here we have to recognize that we are made to be, we are made to be a communion with, one, with others. We do not want to be here. We certainly don't want to spend 
our eternity here in this relational dead end. We need to be in the church. The church is this communion with God in his son, Jesus Christ, and only that pathway is the pathway back. Now, I want to talk a little bit about some of the images, some of the ideas that is, are used in Scripture to help us to recognize this radical communion that we have with God in Jesus Christ by this radical communion that we have with Jesus Christ. Now, there are images that are used, but they're not simply metaphors. We have to get that point across. They're not metaphors, meaning that there is, right, that this is just a, um, a metaphor or something that is something that there is a, a simile, if you will. It's like this, but not really that. Ultimately, it's much more radical than that. Is something that we would call an analogy, where there is a similarity, a great similarity, a great likeness. And it is that, but not that completely. This distinction is important to recognize because it tells us about this radical unity that we now have with God. Everyone who is baptized, and we'll talk more about a state of grace, right? A state of grace means not in a state of mortal sin. Everybody who is baptized and in a state of grace is here in Jesus' one church, one Catholic church, whether they realize it or not. And this is one of the ways that Paul describes this church. In his first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, he uses this image of a body, and I would say an analogy of a body. And this is what he says, for just as the body is one and has many members and all are the members of the body, though many are one, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free and all were made to drink of the one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? And he goes on. You see, there was strife over offices, over gifts, over responsibilities in the early church. Nothing has changed. And St. Paul is using this image. And it's not simply just a model that he's using to address this particular issue. Because he uses this idea of the body of Christ throughout his entire writings. And we see this implicit model throughout the New Testament. He goes on to say a few verses later, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Right? He's not saying you are like the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. And individually we're members of this body. And he goes on to say, and God is appointed in, in the church. In this one church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and then workers of miracles, then healers, helpers, administrators, speakers in various kinds of tongues. And he asks, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing? He's none to all of these. No to all of these, right? All of these are gifts because the entire body has been given different gifts to cooperate with, it, with one another for the whole body. The key is understanding what it is that we are called to. So this image of the body of Christ is something that we have to hold very closely. Right? It shows us really this radical unity. In a very real way, each individual, every individual ever created was created for a particular task that no one else can ever do. 
And if we don't live up, if each of us don't live up to this task that we are called to through all of creation, then the body will suffer because of it. People will not go to heaven if we do not live up to who it is that we're called to be. This is a very important insight. People are always looking at us. We are always affecting other people. And every time, and to, every time we fail to be Christ, to fail to cooperate with Christ, to be an image of Christ to others, we are responsible for the fact that somebody who could have been turned around, somebody who could have been saved, will not be. This is a great and a very important truth, a teaching that we cannot lose sight of. If for no other reason, if for no other reason that we would be holy, this is reason enough. We are members of the body with a particular gift that we are made. And gifts, by the way, are not for us. Gifts are for, this, are for service. They are for others. And ironically, this is where we find our great joy. Well, I won't say ironically. Paradoxically, this is where we find our great joy, our greatest joy by using the gifts God has given us for the good of others, because this is really what is at the point of love. This is the foundation of love. And to the degree we live it perfectly, we live out heroic love. And we'll talk more about heroic love in a couple of sessions. I'd like to talk about one other image, one other model that is crucially important. You see, not only does the church, does St. Paul and the early church show the church as, a, as the body of Christ, it also shows the church as the bride of Christ. And the bride of Christ is chosen for a particular reason. It, and I will say it's not because it's a human institution that's useful to illustrate the, the communion that God has with us. It is a human institution because of the radical communion God already has in himself and because of the union that he has with us in his church. You see, God in himself and the church are archetypes for marriage. And so this is what... St. Paul talks about with regard to this relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. He says, for his, the husband is head of the wife as Christ is the head of the body, the church, and is himself its savior. So as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject in everything to their husbands. We'll talk more about this in the session on the, sec, the sacraments and the liturgy. The point here is that how did Christ love the church? He loved the church so much, right, that he gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, right, make her holy, to make her joyful, because the joy is the fruit of holiness. Holiness is heroic love, perfection in love. Our desire for her heroism is rooted in our desire to love perfectly. It's rooted in our desire for joy as well, because joy is the fruit of this. So he sanctifies her. He cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. Again, we had talked about baptism. that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy, right? Perfected in love. When we read the word holy, we should think perfected in love. That she might be holy and without blemish. And he goes on to say, for no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. 
You see, St. Paul links here to together the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. This one flesh union that we have with Jesus Christ is this bodily union that we have in this marriage. And he says, this is a great mystery. And I mean it in reference to Christ and the church. You see, the, re the mystery is this relationship of man and wife to the church. To, I'm sorry, man and wife to one another as Christ's relationship is to the church. This is the radical unity that we have with him. What we see in the history of the church throughout the Old Testament is that there is this relationship that God has with Israel. You see, right after Adam and Eve fall, God immediately restores a sense of communion through this covenant, but it's deficient, it's defective in the sense that it hasn't brought us the kind of communion that's necessary, this radical communion. But he promises that even though he is marrying the church, and he calls this, we see this especially in the, the prophets. It's a particular type of marriage. It's a betrothal marriage. A betrothal marriage is what? A betrothal marriage in Palestinian culture is this. When the children are still young, the parents really marry the husband, right, to the wife. They choose them and marry them to them. But they don't come to live together until they are of the of age, right? When they've reached the right age, the procreative age, then there is this great marriage feast. And this great marriage feast is usually a week long. And within this marriage feast, there is the consummation of the marriage. And then the two go to live with one another in this radical unity of marriage. We see this in the Old Testament, that God has betrothed himself to Israel. He has betrothed himself to Israel. And in this betrothal, there's this promise that this betrothal will soon be consummated as we get closer and closer to the time of Christ. And Pope St. John Paul II noticed one thing. Every time in the Old Testament, God shows this relationship that he has with Israel as a betrothed husband. He shows him as Israel's redeemer. You see, this spousal love that God has for the church, that the Son, Jesus Christ, has for the church, is as redeemer. God's redemption of the church is as bride groom to bride. In the New Testament, we see this consummation occur. And the early church fathers, the early church fathers were those that we, they were, many were bishops, some were lay theologians, most were bishops or priests, some were deacons. They see this relationship of a betrothal marriage being consummated on the cross in terms that St. Paul uses for Jesus as a second Adam. You see, they see this first Adam, who, how does his bride come about? Where does his bride come from? Well, Adam is put into this, the first Adam is put into this deep sleep. And from this deep sleep, his bride Eve is taken from his side. In the second Adam, as St. Paul calls Jesus, the second Adam is also put into this deep sleep, an even deeper sleep of death. And from his side comes forth his bride. And St. Augustine especially sees, this, sees it this way. The second Adam's bride coming from his side is in the water and the blood. The water, as St. Augustine shows, as the sign of baptism, and the blood, 
as the sign of the Eucharist, these two bookends of the sacraments that initiate us into this. You see, the cross is this consummation. This, again, is why when we look at the the cross, we should think love, redemptive love, spousal love, a love of total self-gift, 